So awesome, thank you very much. Um, uh, in the, just so you are aware, um, the enterprise channel uh, track has been live and it's going on. Uh, the next uh, session on the enterprise uh, track would be GitOps challenges for the enterprise. Now, here on the community track, we have two awesome gentlemen, uh, Lucas uh, and Dennis. I don't want to pronounce their names wrongly. Probably I will learn once they pronounce their names. They are joining us from, oh, I can't remember the name of the country, but they are here joining us. Uh, and they will be speaking about rackets, Racklet. They will be introducing us to Racklet. I think it's a new project. It, I, I'm definitely looking forward to learning more about it. So over to you, Lucas and Dennis. Hi, can you hear us or me? Yes, yes. Very well. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I do a Chrome tab as well. And then Racklet Africa slides. And then jump to the beginning. And off we go. Can you see the screen? And can you hear me as well? I can hear yes. you. Yes, we can. We can see the screen. Perfect. Great. Then let's start. Hi. Uh, welcome to this presentation. And yes, as, as was mentioned here, we're today going to announce our new open source project called Racklet. And we're joining you from Finland today. And we're very excited to be me. at this conference. Cool. So. Um, the cloud. What do you think about when you hear the cloud? Is it someone else's server? Well, if it is, then it's also someone else's problem, right? To manage all of these servers. Like you, you just use it. That, that's, that's great. But what is the problem anyway uh, with managing servers anyway? One can just go to the dashboard and deploy workloads instantly. And this kind of um, this mismatch here in like uh, we can do some of the things uh, through through dashboards without knowing what is you know under underneath what is happening in the real world. Uh, but sometimes you really need that kind of deeper understanding. So let's take an example here of how you know a web app is is introduced in say uh, when you're learning about these things. Then you have this kind of web app simplified model. You know, it's talking to the database and that's, you know, all great. But in the real world, it more looks like this kind of murder mystery that you see here on the right picture. Um, and, and that's just how it is. And how can we kind of bridge the gap of, of this kind of mental model issue that you have this simplification and then in the real world, it's much, more, much, much more complex. Um, so when you learn about something for the first time, you often see it like kind of a black box. So like you don't know what is in there or how it works underneath, but in the reality, it's a system, for example, a cloud composed of many, many components. This we'll, we'll get into later. Um, and as was found in this uh, master's thesis from Kasper Nissen and Martin Jensen at Aarhus University in Denmark, they, they studied this kind of thing and, and wondered like if we have something tangible, something you know, like learning cloud system and something you can touch, you can, you know, roll around with it and, you know, physically change. The object between the student or the, the one that is learning and to, to get the full comprehension of the, the kind of large complex system. That is the case in, in you know, these large cloud native systems these days. So we'd like to introduce Racklet which is this kind, exactly this kind of mediator object. And, uh, and we'll, we'll tell more as we go with this presentation uh, what Racklet is. But, but first, have, uh, we're going to do a short story. So understanding the cloud in a holistic way is really hard. Uh, this here is a visualization of what you as the user or as the developer see when interacting with Kubernetes or deploying your applications compared to all of the behind-the-scene complexity that is required to run a cloud. 
In today's ever more complex technology ecosystem, it is crucial to also see the bigger picture, for example, in order to understand error situations and to make better decisions when uh, developing applications. So let's say that in, I'm in the market for a cloud. What options do I have? Well, the most common option here is to rent some cloud capacity from a provider, uh, from a well-known infrastructure provider, for example, Google Cloud or AWS. This, of course, has running costs that scale with capacity. The other alternative that I have is to um, go directly to the enterprise server hardware vendors and just purchase a bunch of servers and network switches and build my own on-premises data center. This, of course, has very large um, upfront costs. Yep, exactly. So, like for us, we we are both students, and you know that's not realistic to just you know go at, at some some large uh, corporation and say we want to buy all of these servers. That that's not within our budget in any way. So, what can we do? Well, we can build our own cloud from commodity components. For example, like Raspberry Pi and, and some other things uh, of the logos listed here, and that is much cheaper and much more accessible. So the next question is, how do you build a cloud? This is uh, obviously a large undertaking, and uh, you need to bind together many, many smaller hardware and software components, and there's simply no end-to-end -end manual for doing something like this. So here is the infamous cloud-native landscape. Many, where many of these components that if you build your own cloud, if you go that route, you're expected to integrate these things. And, um, you know, it's just overwhelming. <laughs> like, where do you start? You really need some good kind of glue to, to bind all of these things together. Okay, so what is the industry standard glue? Well, one very common way is, is bash, so shell scripting. You, you write something imperatively like run this command first and run that command, but it it's kind of falls apart at some level of complexity where it, it just you know, doesn't work well in error conditions and isn't as robust as it, you know, the glue needs to be for this kind of really complex and dynamic systems. And of course, because nobody likes it when that glue breaks, we aim to form a kind of a stronger glue with Racklet. So in other words, uh, we aim to bind the technologies that we just showed you on the uh, CNCF landscape together in a very nice way with the minimal amount of glue. Right, so let's start from the beginning. Who are we and uh, why did we embark on this kind of journey? So hi, I'm Lukas Chelström from Finland. I'm a former Kubernetes maintainer and have has also been uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, special interest group and working group co-lead. Um, now I'm, I'm studying at Aalto University, but I, I really find this uh, cloud native community uh, super nice and uh, have been uh, doing stuff with the community. For example, here in the Nordic countries, we've run uh, cloud native Nordics. So you might want to check that out. Uh, but also I've been working on new technologies like KubeADM and Weave Ignite. And hi, I'm Dennis. I'm a second year computer science student at Aalto University here in Finland. And I also enjoy working in open source a lot and have just recently entered the cloud native ecosystem and this kind of entire environment uh, to develop new technologies like Weave Ignite and now I'm working on Racklet. I'm really excited to be part of this growing cloud native community. Very cool. So, Let's start by taking a look at how Lucas built a do-it-yourself cloud in 2015. Yeah, so when I heard about Kubernetes for the first time, um, I, I was really, you know, like amazed that the Google open sourced something that, that they had been working on, you know, like for a long time. And, and I was like, okay, that's great. I, I want to contribute. So I, I started to contribute. And the first thing I, I did was to contribute uh, porting Kubernetes to ARM. So that it worked on my Raspberry Pis, because I the only Linux computers I had around were Raspberry Pis, because you know they were cheap and accessible, and and that's why I did it. And uh, eventually I built this kind of this kind of small cloud um, that you see on the picture, and uh, it was fairly straightforward. Um, 
I had a USB hub that was feeding power to all of the Raspberry Pis. Each Raspberry Pi had an SD card, and uh, and then they were connected with a, a normal Ethernet switch. So while your design was functional, Lucas, is there a way uh, that we can make it more reproducible, more automated, and also more secure? Let's first have a look at the hardware. So you used a structure constructed out of plexiglass and screws. And this is purpose built for the single board computers that you had on hand, as we see from the picture. And there is really no easy way to simply replicate what you have constructed here. No, I know. So now that we're re redoing this kind of thing again with Racklet, with this open source project, we want this to be modular it should be re reproducible, and this we um, achieve by 3D printed casing. Uh, also, we want hot swap support, so you can just drag the, the pies out of the thing when, when you need and, and replace them. Then problem number two with my old setup was that the power connectors, as you can see on the picture, were entirely non-standard. So, so like I had to have all kinds of different different power bricks and, and whatnot. And uh, when sometimes the USB hub, which which has all of the, the yellow and, and magenta uh, USB connectors there, that was some sometimes overloaded and, and, you know, like couldn't handle all of the pies at the same time. So we need to find something more robust that is not a single point of failure. And uh, to do that, more robust solution, we can utilize the Raspberry Pi hat standard, so hardware on top, attached on top. So it's essentially a PCB that goes on top of each of the single board computers. And using this, we can power the Raspberry Pis and the other single board computers in a standardized way using the GPIO header. And this kind of standardized hat form factor also allows uh, for monitoring voltage and current of each single board computer separately, and we eliminate the single point of failure. Next, we have the SD cards that are in the Raspberry Pis and the single board computers. As many of you probably know and also have experienced, uh, constantly flashing them is very tiresome, and their durability is limited. And additionally, we cannot guarantee the immutability of the operating system due to there being no kind of read-only switch. And that forces us to inherently do mutable infrastructure. We also have the additional issue that we cannot uh, debug a non-booting single board computer in an easy way. Cool. So so this that's kind of a lot of problems. <laughs> uh, let's, let's take them in order. So first, the SD card, we swap out an SSD, um, which uh, which will give us better capacity, uh, resiliency, and, and also speeds. Um, then we, we switch to using immutable infrastructure, which means that we network boot. When starting the Pi, we network boot a, a pre-made image from some kind of registry, and then you know, do all of the, the security stuff like cryptographic verification. And, and then, but to do this kind of net, secure network booting, we need some kind of hardware root of trust. So we need some kind of key uh, to know is this you know, secure or not. And that we place on the, this kind of hat that Dennis was talking about. We, we have the, the key there, as you can see in this picture. And that is you know, managed by a microcontroller. So now we, we kind of uh, sold a fair amount of things because the microcontroller can communicate with the Pi and say, you know, what are the... Uh, like what is the power state and these kinds of things and what are the boot logs. But now we get to Kubernetes level. And, and this is, you know, Kubernetes is kind of hard to upgrade and, and manage on its own. And, you know, I, I worked on Kubeadm, as I said, um, for quite some time previously. And uh, we, while that went pretty well, and, and now it's a staple in, in all of the, you know, bootstrapping scenarios, it's just a limited block. You know, it's a building block on which you build larger things. So it's not enough to cover this whole scenario. So, and then to, when I was doing this, you know, the way I managed it was I SSH'd in to some kind of IP and node and then ran, you know, kubedm commands or something like that. And that is not really reproducible. So how do we fix this? Well, to avoid this mutable and imperative pattern that you just described, 
we can bake Kubernetes right into the assigned operating system images. So it comes uh, from the network uh, preloaded and everything is set up. You can need, just need to fire it up. And we can also leverage GitOps to achieve a fully declarative infrastructure. So no more running imperative commands anywhere. And all in all, uh, what this means is that in order to upgrade a node, for example, you only need to do a one file change in a pull request, and that's it. That's really cool. But then the next question is like, is these, are these things that we have described, are they realistic? Uh, is, is someone, you know, got to have thought about this before? Um, so is that the case? Well, Yes, someone has thought about this before. The hyperscale as so a large companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon and, and Facebook, they, you know, have, they are running into these problems as well and they have made really excellent solutions. They also have published parts of these, you know, uh, the blueprints of their data centers in open compute projects. And you can see one of the, the kind of designs here on the picture. Um, <clears throat> and um, and here, you know, we have you, with Racklet, we have taken inspiration and, and want to make a scale model of these kinds of really, you know, large open compute project servers. We want to make something smaller, but, but still kind of have the same characteristics. And indeed, the architecture that we just described to you here with this visual visualization borrows many concepts from the open compute project and also from the uh, cloud native ecosystem. It has, for example, uh, optimized power delivery. We have hardware and software security features, and we also have a fully declarative configuration with immutable inf infrastructure. Cool. So that said, you know, like all of these things, we these are aspirations that, that we can also say. You have probably seen this kind of learning curve picture before. We want to emphasize that we're really in the beginning of this journey, where we have been thinking about these things, you know, for a while now, but it's, it's really like early stage. So we'd like to invite you to, to join us as in journey, you know, to the top. And so yeah. to guide us on this journey, we've defined a set of values uh, to drive the development of Racklet. Let's see what those are. So the first one, the first value is security. We emphasize security really highly in this, and that's a, a main distinguishing factor between Racklet and some other projects. And we want to use, you know, the good stuff that has been developed in the cloud native ecosystem and also in the open source firmware ecosystem. So here are some logos uh, that, that with projects that we want to integrate. And once we've kind of fully wrapped our heads around these kinds of really uh, great security projects, but also pretty complex, we want to uh, share these findings with you on the Racklet blog to, to, you know, distill it down and say that what they really do and how to use it. And as the second value, we have interoperability. And this is really important uh, to avoid this very common XKCD standard scenario that's depicted here. And our approach uh, to avoiding this is to combine upcoming and cutting edge standards uh, with the least amount of glue possible. So this means that we want to explicitly avoid creating new and redundant standards that only apply to this project. Right. So one of the things we want to do is to do things declaratively. So we have controllers which, you know, have this observe diff act loop to let you focus on the task at hand. So you say, what should the end result be, not how to get there? And, you know, here we're going to use Kubernetes great API model and the whole ecosystem to be uh, interoperable with other projects. And on the firmware level, we aim to explore integrating this set uh, of observable and modern protocols and technologies. We want to uh, explicitly avoid any kind of obfuscated and legacy protocols that are hard to comprehend and to debug. Cool, and we want to emphasize all of Racklet's source code, design files, documentation, everything is open source up on GitHub. And in addition to the public availability, the Racklet hardware design itself will be also as accessible and as reproducible as possible. So, for example, we are going to leverage um, 3D printing. Uh, we are going to leverage 3D printing and an open source CAD workflow uh, for all of the structural components of this project. 
cool. And the schematics will be also made open source or open hardware in KiCad, for example. We have a markdown book online, docsracklet.io, which is work in progress, uh, where you can find the documentation for the software components. And everything, all the rest of the stuff will be just off-the-shelf components, which means you can buy it in your local web store. And uh, the fact that it's off the shelf also means that we need to focus on modularity and compatibility, which is our fourth value. So a record aims to be as modular as possible up to the point of supporting different uh, single board computers uh, that comply to the uh, Raspberry Pi form factor. So we see this future where there's an ecosystem of record compatible hardware and software. And we are also uh, planning to implement multi-architecture support, meaning that you can use your existing x86 servers and hardware that you're flying around to run record software. Cool. And one of the uh, transparency is one of the values as well. We want to demystify the cloud stack and make it more accessible. And that's why we, we're going to use these kind of good cloud native projects like Jaeger, Prometheus, uh, you know, open metrics to to make all of the, the things in the uh, system observable. And after that, we have maintainability and upgradability as the sixth value. So the maintenance burden of keeping a Reclet cluster running and up to date should be really minimal, such that, for example, uh, software upgrades should be very much seamless. We don't want uh, to have uh, an IT team, IT team specialized to just maintaining this rack. It should be done, uh, be able to be upgraded by anyone. And on the hardware side, we also uh, support or aim to support hot swapping and then upgrades of individual components so that you can, um, so that we can minimize e-waste and you don't need to throw away the entire rack if you want to upgrade something. Cool. And the last one is affordability. We want to use cheap commodity components or inexpensive ones such that it's compared to, you know, like these large scale servers. If you would, if we would buy a stack of them, Racklet is much more cost effective. And also, thanks to the modularity that Dennis was talking about, you can also make Racklet fit your, or your budget or local uh, availability. And let's take a look at the use cases. So. First of all, we envision Racklet to become a staple in the home labs of um, cloud native and tinkering enthusiasts, mainly due to the affordability and hackability of the system. And this kind of open source nature of Racklet also enables this community to contribute their ideas and innovations back upstream. Cool. And then we have education, which is super important in this field. We want that, you know, for example, universities and other educational institutes should be able to, to get a rack or a racklet easily and use that for education of these cloud computing systems. And who knows, like using this kind of system, racklet could be the start of someone's cloud native career. As a sort of scale model of a real cloud, uh, racklet is also suitable for many research and development applications in uh, cloud native infrastructure, as well as the cloud native patterns and paradigms. And this kind of sandbox could lead to broader cloud native research and thus increased uh, adoption in the space. Cool. And edge computing is also a really, you know, booming field in this at this moment. And for that purpose, you need versatile tools. We think that Racklet with its declarative infrastructure, high security, and great interoperability could be a great fit here. And Racklet is not just about hardware and software design. Our fundamental goal is to build an inclusive and diverse community around the project and an ecosystem. With the ecosystem, um, there's already a lot of uh, great people advancing the state of art, uh, state of the art of these kind of systems. So here we are showcasing the work by Turing Machines Incorporated, as well as Ivan Kuleshov. Both of these uh, initiatives are super cool, and we look forward to collaborating with their authors. Cool. And then we want to emphasize that we want to make the bar barrier of entry um, for learning cloud native lower 
So we want to get more people into this field, and we think that this could be one way forwards. And um, that means maybe this is your path to mastering cloud native. So with all this said, we focused on the mission and planning of Raclette for quite a while. And hence, we have not written any code nor designed the actual rack yet. That work is on track to start this summer. So yeah, we, we're really just in the beginning. As Dennis said, no code yet. We invite everybody that is that are interested in this to join us on this journey. With that said, uh, we're going to leave you with this XKCD. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome presentation, awesome topic. And yeah, uh, I really, really learned a lot about Racklets. And yeah, I, and I hope uh, the audience as well learned a lot as well. So yeah, thanks a lot, Lucas and Dennis, for the awesome presentation. And I think this is the time for Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for either Lucas or Dennis, please feel free to drop it on the chat section. And Lucas, uh, if you don't mind, would you like to share a link to the open source project that we have on the chat so that our attendees can have easy access to, to the link? Yeah, absolutely. We'll do that in, in just just a moment. Awesome. And it's, it's raclet.io raclet and then the GitHub oh, nice. is raclet as well. Nice. So, do you have uh, any questions from YouTube? I don't see them uh, here. Let's yeah, see. so we are currently on YouTube. Sure. Uh, OK. OK, so basically, um, I think it was just basically positive comments. Uh, Motoraya said, very insightful. I hope to learn more. Um, yeah, we've not had any questions. Cool. Yes. We'll we'll definitely uh, yeah, also cool. upload the slides afterwards, so you can we can watch them and awesome. and check it out. Awesome, awesome, yeah, awesome, great. Um, maybe we could just hang around for like a minute or two to see if anyone have any questions we'd love like to ask. Let's see. Is there anything at the stage? Um, yeah, but but I, I would want to ask so. Um, because uh, I, I didn't join in when you started, but I would want to know what was the motivation behind you know, Drew Lucas and Dennis starting the Ranglet uh, project. So the motivation is to, well, learn more about this stuff because we as we showed in the slide like we're really on the beginning <laughs> like also exactly. having been in the <laughs> you know community yeah. for some time, it's it's really just like the start. Uh, so we want to learn more. That is, you know, a personal motivation. But also, we we you know really want to, um, as I was describing, like lower the, the barrier of entry to this field by doing these tangible things and and you know making it easier to uh, understand. You know, and this is so complex. All of these cloud native things. I you know, I I don't have no idea. You know, how many CNCF projects there, there are these days. There's just so many every day coming in. And uh, and then that would be this would we hope would be the you know perfect test bed for that kind of stuff. So you know like you you want to try something out you know you just like download it and, and see it then you can plug wires and stuff and and have it really tangible. Uh, that is that is why we start a project. But but I said like we, there's no code yet just like design and and these kinds of ideas and and we're you know we're open to all kinds of feedback from the community. Yeah. Also. Also. Dennis, you want to add something? Yeah, I can just add uh, that kind of, we also felt that there was a huge discrepancy between what the hyperscalers were doing. They were going full steam ahead with their custom cloud solutions. And we kind of <laughs> layman, normal consumer people here are just kind of left behind. So we wanted to research into this state of the art and kind of how can we bring this into home labs and education? How can we make people aware of these systems? So that was also one uh, incentive behind this. Yeah, that's good to hear. Actually, we have a question. So someone said, uh, 
can a person with no coding skill join Rackland? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Can you say again? Yeah, can a person with no coding skill join Rackland? Yes, yes. Yes, um, they can. So one of the, the great things about this is that as we go, we want to uh, demystify things. So like as we learn the different projects, say, say you know, the update framework I'm working on at the moment. So that is a very kind of complex, uh, that is a very, you know, academic uh, CNCF project. And, and you know, I, I some years ago, I had taken a look at it, but just like, uh, you know, I, I, I can't do it. Uh, after time, some time, but now I've spent some months and actually try to understand it well. And what I'm going to do then is, you know, uh, or, or what we're going to do as a team is is make a blog post about this to say like, okay, in, in normal terms, like what does it mean and why should you use it and what are the benefits and that kind of stuff. And, um, and one way to contribute is, you know, using uh, docs. So like I exactly in that, that way, you you see some kind of nice project and and then you're like okay I, I want to understand this more then you you know we can discuss it we can you know have this kind of community we, we talk about it and then you write this kind of blog post that okay so here is what I learned and you know if I knew these three things before I started it looking into project X that would have been amazing and now I'm you know gonna share that with others so that is one of the, the great ways to to do uh, to contribute but also well Dennis can comment on this more uh, like 3D printing, you know, like there's a lot of, uh, you know, you need to be great uh, at, at designing CAD stuff or electronics or microcontrollers or, or that kind of that kind of stuff, or just community yeah. or like uh, community management is a super important uh, is super important work, um, you know, helping people find each other and these kinds of things. That's that's you know, people for example in special interest group contributor experience that uh, Santochi was talking about it is like just amazing so like that as well could be could be a place and of course uh, if you're great at writing documentation or you want to learn more then I also or we as a team also highly encourage reading through the the request for comments documents of Racklet and kind of even small contributor contributions like fixing typos and uh, improving wording and saying that this chapter is unclear, all of that is, is highly appreciated. So feel free, there's so many different things uh, that you can do in Racklet and feel free to just come in and contribute. Yeah, and if you don't know where to start, just, you know, like join the Slack and ask, where do I start? Like, these are my skills yeah. <laughs> and then we'll find something. <laughs> Help is oh, we need to add the Slack to the slides as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Lucas, it seems like you wanted to. So I, I just saw that there's a, uh, another question. Uh, is NanoPy from Friendly, Friendly Alec uh, supported? Uh, so, well, I, we, <laughs> we don't have any, any code yet, so we don't support, uh, or there's no nothing that actually um, yeah. implements. Right now we can't support. Uh, <laughs> right now we can't say that we support it, but uh, let's just say that it is in the in the list of uh, single board computers that we plan to uh, support as a first party. So yes. yes, so so we won't. But but if you have a NanoPy, then you know a great way to contribute is also you know um, try you know when there's some code, then try it out and say that you know like this stack of errors you know <laughs> came up because you hadn't thought about this. Then that's great feedback as well. <laughs> exactly. Wow, awesome, awesome. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really glad that you actually mentioned the part where people can actually contribute to the docs because you know, when people hear about open source contributions, they just think it's just cool. Well, you know, you can contribute to docs, you can contribute to feature you know, posts the docs, you know, anything basically. So yeah, um, awesome uh, presentation, awesome uh, conversations we've had so far. Um, and yeah, I think we are on time or out of time, let's see. Yeah, exactly. So I, I would want to ask Dennis one question, but I don't know if we have enough time for that. But I, I think I will have to proceed anyways. So uh, Dennis, you, I see a student and you're also an open source developer. So like, how do you manage your time basically? Because I mean, like the fact that you, you and Lucas are 
you know, considering working on this project called Racklet means you have to dedicate a lot of time to Racklet as well as to study it. So how do you tend to like, manage the time? Well, that balance <laughs> is also kind of the reason why we haven't uh, gotten to write uh, any code or do any hardware design yet. <laughs> so it's kind of studying still uh, is, is yeah. my primary job. And then uh, I do just open source small contributions on the side uh, when I have the time, which is really tight. But then I hope uh, that in the summer, uh, I've kind of dedicated the whole summer to work on Racklet so that we can actually get the project kickstarted. Yeah, that's, that's also why it fits perfectly with uh, uh, this conference to, to tell people about it, that, you know, now we're just like starting to ramp up. We haven't, you know, said, as we said, like done much more than the, the idea part. And, uh, and now we're going to start doing stuff when we get a bit more time in the summer. Because, yeah, it's, it's tight with university. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Dennis and Lucas, for your awesome presentation. And, yeah, um, Abu, uh, Abu Bakar, would you want to take it off from here?